It's now my pleasure to introduce today's special guest and commencement speaker, Monica Ramirez Amadani. She was chosen in consultation with the presidents of the graduating classes. Monica Ramirez Amadani is the president and CEO of Public Counsel. Public Counsel is the nation's largest public interest law firm, specializing in civil rights litigation, community building, advocacy, and policy change. Every year, their direct legal service helps thousands of people who are experiencing poverty. Ms. Ramirez Almadani has been a civil rights lawyer and a leader for nearly two decades. After graduating from Harvard University and Stanford Law School, she clerked for the late Honorable Warren J. Ferguson on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. She went on to serve as an Equal Justice Works Fellow and then a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union. She advocated for the rights of undeserved, underserved immigrant communities. Ms. Ramirez Almadani has served in several leadership positions in federal and state government, including the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, and in the California Civil Department of Justice, where she advised then Attorney General and now Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, on criminal justice and civil rights issues. Before joining public counsel, Ms. Ramirez Almadani was a visiting clinical law professor and co-director of the Immigrant Rights Clinic at the University of California Irvine School of Law. As special counsel at Covington and Burling, she served as part of the senior litigation team representing the University of California and successfully challenged the Trump administration's decision to rescind the Deferred Action for Child Arrival program. Ms. Ramirez Almadani is the daughter of Mexican immigrants and grew up in Huntington Park, a working class immigrant community in Southeast Los Angeles. She's married to a Berkeley Law graduate and has a new baby that was born last month. She has three sons. I cannot imagine a better role model for our graduates and for all of us or a better commencement speaker today. So please join me in welcoming the commencement speaker the commencement of 2022, Monica Ramirez Amadani. Wow, this is a big crowd. Let me just really take it in. <laughs> this is incredible. It's also very hot up here. So for those of you who are COVID safe and have your masks, um, they also work very well as a fan. So I'll be using mine as that. Good morning, Berkeley. Good morning. What an honor to be here today. Thank you, Dean Chemerinsky, for that extremely kind introduction. I am a longtime member of the Chemerinsky Fan Club since my days at the ACLU. And so it's quite an honor and very surreal to be introduced by you. So thank you so much. And thank you, of course, to the Berkeley Law Class of 2022 for the opportunity to celebrate this very special day with all of you. Congratulations on graduating from one of the most esteemed academic institutions in the country. What an incredible achievement. Congratulations. <laughs> to the faculty and staff, Kudos to you for the unwavering support that I'm confident you've shown all these amazing students over the past three years, over um, obviously during a very difficult time in our nation's history. And to the parents and those who helped raise and guide you, congratulations to you as well. My husband and I drove from Los Angeles with our three-year-old son Rumi, who's actually here, just down there. Hi, Rumi. And with our four-week-old newborn, yes, four-week-old newborn, to be here today. We are so proud to have survived the long drive up the five freeway, as you can imagine, and to have slept a total of three hours last night that I could only imagine the sense of pride that you parents 
must feel at seeing your children reach this incredible milestone. In all seriousness, parents, grandparents, step-parents, loved ones, can you please stand again for all of us to recognize your sacrifice for your children? Please stand. Let's give it up for the parents, the faculty, the staff, your supporters who are cheering you on today. It really does take a village, trust me. I am very, very fortunate to stand here this morning. The last time I wore this gown was at my law school graduation about 18 years ago. I never would have imagined wearing it again from this beautiful stage at the Greek theater. Wow. I don't know exactly what you're thinking in this moment, but I remember thinking at my graduation, how did I get here? Is this real? Will I pass the bar exam in a few months? Am I going to make it as an attorney? See, about 10 years before my graduation, I had sat in an overcrowded auditorium at my public high school in Southeast LA. It was an orientation assembly of some kind and the principal told us, a room full of starry-eyed freshmen, to look to our left, this is my left, to look to our right, because one of us, meaning half of the hundreds of students in that room, would not graduate from high school in four years. Now imagine if Dean Chemerinsky had said something similar to you three years ago when you started your journey. How would that have made you feel? The statement, as harsh and demoralizing as it was on its face, did not faze me or anyone in that room. We were accustomed by that young age, sadly, to know that our prospects were bleak, that graduating from high school, much less going to college, was not for everyone, and especially not for kids like us from an inner city, working class, and immigrant background. Now fast forward four years later, I left my family and home for college, and I prayed, prayed, that once again, I would defy the odds and make it through the next four years. I boarded a red-eye flight from Los Angeles to Boston overnight. My parents were afraid to let me go, understandably, but also incredibly supportive to their credit that I had been accepted to Harvard. My mom and dad had not gone to college. My dad had completed only sixth grade in Mexico before he was forced to work as a farmer with his father and eventually immigrated to the United States as a teenager. For that life-changing trip, again by myself, I had two suitcases that my mom helped me carefully pack. I think I have five suitcases just for this weekend with my kids here. <laughs> but I had two suitcases and you know, just enough clothes for the fall, no heavy winter coat. I don't think we realized how cold Boston was. A few family pictures and other keepsakes from friends. A heavy plastic bag of powder washing detergent to wash my clothes. Now, this was not a box of detergent. My mother took a garbage bag and put powder washing detergent in that bag, tied it up, and went into one of my suitcases. Clearly, she didn't think I was capable of buying detergent. Um, I think a lot of moms can relate. And of course, a bottle of my favorite Mexican hot sauce, Tapatio, to be precise for those in the know. Um, Tapatio is very popular, especially in California. There's a picture of a man with a big sombrero. That man and I have traveled together for many, many <laughs> years. Um, with me in, in every part of my professional experience. No laptop or other computer, no cell phone in those days, if you can believe it, nothing else except for my dreams. And that's when my life changed. That's when I was transported to a different world. Now imagine this, I arrive in Boston, again by myself, had never visited Harvard. It's cold, the streets feel very empty, it's early in the morning. 
I'm hungry. I buy my very first croissant ever. I love croissants with the little cash that I had at the time. And I spend the rest of the early morning in front of Harvard Yard just waiting for the orientation tables to be set up so that I can pick up my keys and I can meet my roommates. Jet lagged and overwhelmed, it was one of the longest days of my life. While it started with enthusiasm and anticipation, it ended with fear and self-doubt. See, as I saw other students arrive with their parents in fancy SUVs and nice cars, I noticed how comfortable they were. Literally, they had extra pillows, blankets, lamps for their rooms. I had never heard of or seen a futon until that day. Same for the sport of lacrosse. I had no idea what that was. <laughs> they were smiling with their parents and greeting other students they already knew. They seemed to fit right in. It was confusing and intimidating for me. My parents could not afford to travel with me. Honestly, I, I had no clue that they were even expected to. But as much as it hurt to be alone, I knew it was better that way. See, I didn't want my mom and dad to see my insecurity. They were so proud of me. And I didn't want to disappoint them. And I didn't want others to see their insecurity either. How would my roommates react to my parents' broken English? Where would my parents have stayed? I had to face the immediate challenge before me on my own, believing that I had to hide my true self to be seen and to be accepted by those around me. So I tried very hard to hide. I hid my Spanglish accent, my way of life, not realizing at the time that hiding is no way to be seen, no way to be heard, and no way to make an impact. Many years later, as I began my career as an immigrants' rights and civil rights lawyer at the ACLU, I felt shame about those moments and those experiences. As I represented individuals who reminded me of my parents, of my family, of my community, I fought so hard to tell their stories, to uplift their voices, and to advocate for their well-being, yet I was still struggling to fit in, to speak confidently, to be comfortable, to be me. Despite my degrees from Harvard and Stanford, I worried constantly that I wasn't smart enough, creative enough, or polished enough to truly succeed in the legal profession. I kept looking to my left, to my right, Waiting, waiting to not make it. Fearing I would be one of those ill-fated kids whose luck would soon run out. That's how I felt in my law school graduation too. Imposter syndrome. That's a term we've all heard and many of us have used to describe our educational and professional experiences. That feeling of not belonging and pretending to be someone else. Again, despite all the external evidence of your competence, those experiencing imposter syndrome, sadly often women and people of color, but others too, do not believe they deserve their success or their luck. And they fear being exposed as a fraud. Fake it until you make it. That always sounded so appealing to me. Fake it until you make it. Okay, fake it until you, you make it. What does that even mean? I am here today to urge you to dispose of that phenomenon immediately, right now. Don't waste any time wondering if you're even experiencing imposter syndrome. Don't talk about it. Don't give it any power. See, if I could go back in time, that's exactly what I would do, and here's why. As technical as it may seem when you're studying for the bar exam, the law is not about formula, formulas, 
or memorizing legal rules and established precedents. Although you should do that, of course, for the bar exam. At its most fundamental level, to be a lawyer is to understand and deal with the complexity of our society. And to do that, to genuinely succeed in that, you must draw from your own lived experience and your own sense of justice, from your own roots and your own values. It is not about pretending or faking it. It's about truly trusting in yourself to be that courageous advocate that you have been training to be at this world-class university. In my nearly 20 years of practice, I have had the fortune to serve those most in need, those facing challenges far, far greater than my own. Families separated and harmed because of our broken immigration system, victims of human trafficking and child exploitation stripped of their dignity and innocence, low-wage workers taken advantage of by unscrupulous employers, young people living in agonizing legal limbo, legal limbo, even though they were raised here, simply because they were not born here. I've also had the privilege to work in public service at the highest levels of the Justice Department in Washington, D.C., and in our state, advising leaders whose policy and legal decisions affect countless people, including the most vulnerable among us. And I've explored other passions and practice areas by teaching law and working in the private sector. All of those experiences led me to my current role, of which I am incredibly proud. As the president and Helen and Morgan Chu, CEO Distinguished Chair, it's a very long title, of public counsel. As Dean Chemerinsky said, public counsel is the nation's largest public interest law firm specializing in providing free legal services to lower income communities and communities of color. There is no question that I could not have had the rich and diverse professional and leadership experiences that I've had without believing in myself and doing the hard work that was required. Yet, that nagging self-doubt lingered for many years until I fully realized and appreciated how fortunate I am to be in a profession that demands more of me, more of all of us, than proving ourselves to others. It's a profession that demands something more noble, that we pursue justice. This became even more clear to me in those dark and uncertain early days of the pandemic. In 2019, I had decided to leave my law firm to pursue clinical teaching at UC Irvine Law School. I was excited to be on a university campus full time, to work with students like you, to have the time and space to think, write, and teach about immigration and civil rights, the areas to which I had devoted most of my career. Little did I know that within months, I would be teaching remotely with a toddler in tow, fearing that we would get sick. My students' stress, as you can all relate, and their fatigue were palpable. We couldn't see our clients. We couldn't share ideas in person. The screen time was and is simply exhausting. Honestly, I was so worried that today's commencement would be via Zoom. Thank you for having me here in person. However, I knew how lucky I was during that time, and now you are, to have the education, training, and tools to make a difference in society during a time of significant crises. I started law school a few weeks before 9-11 happened. It was a disruptive moment in history that forced us as students to think more critically about our futures. As we all know by now, COVID has exposed and exacerbated historic and entrenched racial, economic, gender, and other inequities in our society in such a profound way that we have an obligation to act. We all do. 
And I know many of you have already made a difference as students here at Berkeley. What's more, our democracy is in flux in a way that we have not experienced in a very long time. We see alarming signs of democratic backsliding and political polarization that should concern all of us. Democracies are built on strong and independent institutions, and our system of justice is among the most important for a democracy to flourish. So here's the good news. As lawyers, especially with your exceptional education and experience which sets you apart, we have the power to right wrongs, to pursue equity and fairness, especially during times of turmoil and crisis. The challenges of the day, and there are many, are your opportunities to make your mark that will live on in service of future generations, that will serve your children and their children. The wise words of Ralph Waldo Emerson speak to me in a way that I hope speak to you. The purpose of life is not to be happy. Not to be happy, Emerson said. Now listen to this. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. To have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Shed and shred those insecurities. The legal career you're about to embark on, like the rest of your life, is your journey. No one else's. Make it count. Have the courage to be true and fair to yourself. Embrace who you are and what you bring to our profession. Challenge yourself to make brave decisions that make sense for you to work hard to follow your passion and dreams, even if it means taking great risks and feeling alone at times. In that journey, in that process, please, please resist the temptation to compare yourself to others. Contrary to my high school principal's early lessons on life, no one needs to fail because as I've learned through my journey in this profession, we all succeed much better together and have the courage to seek truth and fairness to others, to advance the cause of equality, to use your advocacy skills to ensure justice for those most on the margins. Don't ever forget that our profession is one of bounty. It's noble and full of different and higher paths that allow you to grow and uplift others. Don't be afraid to try new things and seek support from those around you, those with more experience, Learn from those who disagree with you, too. They're not your en enemy. They can help you expand your horizons. None of us alone can change the world around us. But by recognizing and appreciating the unique moment we're living in, every one of us can make some difference, as you already have. I mentioned my dad before, how he wasn't able to go to school beyond the sixth grade and immigrated from Mexico as a teenager. For all of his working life in the United States, my dad worked nights at a produce trucking company in downtown Los Angeles, not, not too far from where we lived. On the day that he retired, he asked me to visit for the very first time the warehouse where he had worked for more than 40 years. I remember feeling sad and embarrassed that I had never seen where he had toiled at night for all those years while my sisters and I slept comfortably at home. That day, he wanted to show his boss by bringing me in to the warehouse what he had achieved by working there. That sense of pride in my education that discipline that he taught me, that resilience that he represented and still represents, is what inspires me every day to lead my incredible organization and to fight for those in need. Those often in the shadows who, like my father, 
have had to struggle to make ends meet and support a, fa a family in the face of tremendous odds. As I said, I am very fortunate to stand here this morning. Fortunate to stand here as my father's daughter, as my mother's daughter. Graduates, please stand with me, please. <laughs> We are all so fortunate to celebrate your success today. Your potential, trust me, is limitless. Your voice is beautiful and powerful. Please don't ever forget that. Go out there and make some difference. I wish you all the very best. Congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. And thank you once again for the honor to share in your day. Go Berkeley.